thinking about the performance of a low impurity mega ampere dense plasma focus. So we're trying to reduce the impurities in a dense plasma focus. And these impurities come from a number of sources we found from our previous experiments. First of all, there's arcing at joins between any metal parts of the electrode. Second of all, and very important, there's erosion right at the edge of the insulator, which is not shown in this picture, uh, where the discharge starts. And third, you get erosion when the electron beam hits the anode. And although that happens after the pinch, you get dust that can affect the next shot. So what we are working on is the hypothesis that reducing impurities can eliminate the plateau in the yield um, of the DPF that interrupts the I to the fourth, the current with the fourth scaling. So to do this, we've switched over to monolithic tungsten electrodes. That completely eliminates arcing. There's only one part to each electrode. Second of all, we're using pre-ionization to reduce the runaway electrons that we blame for the erosion near the insulator. Now, we ran into the problem with tungsten of oxides that are very easy to vaporize. So we used bake out and a titanium nitride coating on the vacuum chamber to minimize the oxides. And finally, we're using a longer chamber to get any debris from the electron beam away from the electrodes. And we're trying to use a deuterium nitrogen mix that we think theoretically can reduce the power of the electron beam. So this shows our monolithic oops, electrodes. This is our longer chamber, which is wrapped in its bake-out blanket. This is the very pretty gold-colored titanium nitride coating. And this is um, a still from our video of the pre-ionization discharge. Well, we achieved only partial success. What we did achieve was a glow discharge pre-ionization, but we still had oxides. What we found experimentally was that if there's arcing during the pre-ionization pulse, even though the current is very small, we still get erosion. My colleague Syed Hassan pointed this out. So we needed to switch over to a steady glow discharge with only a, a few microamps current for good pre-ionization. And uh, my colleague Ivy Karamitsos suggested that since we were having trouble getting a steady glow with a shunt resistor, that we should try to separate the pre-ionization from the uh, charging process. So we did that. We set up a power supply. Fred von Russell uh, got a circuit to protect the power supply from the bank current when it fires. And we found that we had to add 5% nitrogen to get a stable discharge to, with the deuterium. The bake-out was successful in eliminating oxides, but unfortunately we had a faulty valve which reintroduced water vapor and thus oxides in fairly large amount. So that was not success totally successful. As a result, we found that we couldn't uh, get good pinches with a nitrogen mix over 10%. So we still had some beam erosion. So the net result of all this is that we're really running with a lower impurity of about 30% by mass, not truly low impurity yet. Nonetheless, we got considerably better results. Basically, what we found was that we got a 50% increase in peak and mean yield and also ion temperature. And we got a fourfold decrease in the variability of the yield, which, as people know, is a big problem with the DPF. So using just the monolithic tungsten, pure deuterium, no pre-ionization, that alone 
led to a 50% increase in both peak and mean yield. If we combine that with the nitrogen mix and pre-ionization, we still got the 50% increase in mean yield, but we also got a 50% increase in both peak and mean ion uh, temperature, which is a new record for any DPF, we believe, and we got only a 14% standard deviation in yield, which is a fourfold decrease. So this is the data in some detail. And you can see this is somewhat preliminary because we still have a small number of shots. For each condition, we only have uh, seven to 10 shots. Now for copper, our old electrodes, this is actually the best 10 shots out of hundreds of shots with similar conditions. Um, the numbers in red are the results that are at least significantly different at the 1% level from the copper results. So this is the results for copper, for tungsten with pure deuterium, tungsten with the nitrogen mix, no pre-ionization, and tungsten with pre-ionization. So you see we get up to 2.5 times 10 to the 11th and our best shot um, at 1.1 megaamps. And with pre-ionization, we get this lower yield uh, standard deviation, lower variability, and we get all the way up to 225 keV measured by horizontal perpendicular time of flight with very similar conditions to these 10 we actually got one shot up to 260, and the mean was 124 keV. And this is quite adequate with good density, with better density, to ignite hydrogen boron fuel, the advantages of which Dr. Hora has outlined yesterday. So compared with other DPF, this is now a yield at least 50% above any other results with this current, and about double uh, any results with the charging uh, energy of 60 kilojoules. So how does this happen? Well, this is what we think is happening. Uh, as with my old school model, with the DPF, the uh, finish depends on the origin. So we start out at the origin of the pulse. We have evidence that pre-ionization definitely reduces the erosion of the anode, because we see in these variations, oscillations in the current as the pulse starts out, that there's much less decrease in the current with pre-ionization than with no pre-ionization with identical conditions otherwise. And we've roughly calculated the amount of energy in the difference, and that's amount of energy that's quite capable of vaporizing the roughly 600 or 700 micrograms of tungsten we think is in our uh, discharge in the plasma sheet. So when we get to the end of the pulse, what we find is this early beam phenomenon, which is the emission of a beam well before the pinch, which we see as a diversion of energy and we were observing for years with the copper electrodes. This goes way down with the tungsten electrodes and disappears entirely with pre-ionization. So the early beam has gone away, and as a result, we definitely have evidence that there's better transfer of energy into the pinch. This is the voltage on the anode, uh, at the time of the pinch, and we can see with the tungsten electrodes, we go all the way up to about 110 k, uh, kilovolts. That's almost uh, triple the charging voltage of 40 kilovolts, and that's a lot more than the 60 kilovolts we were getting with copper. So all of this indicates we're making progress, but we're not where we want to be. First of all, the oxides are still present, and they're decreasing too slowly. We estimate only about 1% per shot. Um, we don't know yet 
if pre-ionization eliminates or simply reduces the uh, erosion near the insulator, and whether that's due to the tungsten in com combination with the pre-ionization or just the pre-ionization. We don't see any real increase in density yet, and no real enhancement of yield with the N2 mix. We use the N2 mix right now just to stabilize the pre-ionization. And we're still about a factor of eight away from continuing the I to the fourth scaling law. So what we're going to do next is, first of all, get a better picture of what's happening. We're going to take ICCD images of both the pinch region and the insulator region. And we have windows that can reach both of those regions. We know we can eliminate the oxides. We can use better technique. And we're looking at the possibility of using a silver plating. So that would give up the high temperature qualities of the tungsten, but oxi oxygen is very easily removed from silver. Um, and silver would be a good analog for our next step, which is uh, a beryllium anode with a central hole. So we know that we'd eliminate the beam erosion because the beam would go out to another chamber through the central hole. And we'd get much lower, uh, obviously, no heavy element uh, impurities with beryllium. So when we put these things together, we're still confident in the coming months we will be able to test a truly low impurity DPF as a step towards using this with hydrogen boron fuel. Thank you very much for your attention. second after after the pinch of the compression the maximum cost. so it means that we have practically in in the pinch pure deuterium pinch after that we observe the copper lines right. uh, and, and for, for these measurements it will be nice to look on this if you observe the the impurities inside the pinch or not we Mike. we are taking optical spectra and moving the, the viewpoint of the spectrometer from the top to the bottom and then to the pinch area. Now, our spectrometer has no time resolution. It's time integrated. But the sheath itself acts as a time resolution as it passes by the, the viewing window. And we see very strong tungsten lines even at the top. So we know that we're getting tungsten in the sheath from the very start. And uh, it simply increases as you go down. If you look at the pinch area, then the lines are very intense. But that, we feel, includes what you're talking about, which is the later tungsten that's coming off of the anode. I think that my guess is that in the PF1000, you have a pure um, plasma than we do because you have spread out the, um, the current much greater. Your current density is one quarter of ours. And that leads to a nonlinear reduction in the amount of erosion. So what we're trying to do is get the best of both worlds, get a small electrodes which leads to higher yield, and we are getting a lot higher yield than VF1000, but doing these various techniques to get rid of the erosion that comes with that very high current density. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you.